I'm George Crump, lead analyst with Storage Switzerland. Storage Switzerland is an analyst firm focused on the storage, virtualization, and cloud compute market spaces. This is the first in a series of videos that we'll be producing that will chalk talk through interesting technologies that we hear from our readers that they want to know more about. One of the big ones is the storage hypervisor. It's a new concept that really builds on uh, existing concepts to make virtualization, uh, the management of storage and the virtualized infrastructure uh, easier and more cost effective than it has been in the past. So let's jump in. If we look at the traditional turnkey storage architecture that has been really prevalent in the data center for the last 25 years or so, it's really built on a pretty simple architecture. You have a storage compute engine that contains typically two controllers. Those controllers go out to connecting hosts or more commonly nowadays into a storage switch that the hosts connect into. That controller then connects into storage shelves, which is where all our capacity is. But really, the intelligence and all the work is really done here at the controller. So what we're looking for there is the ability to provide services and functionality at the controller level. And most vendors have really stepped up and provide a lot of functionality uh, from this controller. What started as basic volume management, which was assigning a, a, a section of disks to a server and having that server be able to talk to it and write data to it, now very quickly became RAID, RAID 1, RAID 3, RAID 4, RAID 5, and, and now even RAID 6. And then it has really progressed even further to really more of what we call storage virtualization, which is really the topic of this section. Well, we really don't care anymore what the individual's disks do. The controller just pre prevents, presents an abstracted layer to the host. And from there, the host can do all the work of interacting. The challenge, though, is that this controller now is doing a lot of functionality. It's doing the volume management. It's doing uh, something called thin provisioning which is the dynamic allocation of space and, and, and something that we almost really expect in a storage controller nowadays. It can do snapshots, which is the ability to take the table information that the controller uses to figure out where data really is on the storage system and make a copy of that table and present a image, if you will, of that volume, but not have to actually use the capacity. So again, another very common feature that we expect to see in storage controllers today. And then a growing one that we're seeing more and more of is something called cloning, which builds on snapshots, except now we can actually change the snapshot after it's taken. This becomes critical in server virtualization and desktop virtualization environments, where what we want to be able to do is build on a master template and then create a thousand desktops based on that master template yet maybe e allow each one of those thousand desktops to individually uh, change and set their own profiles and their own customization. And then finally, a big one we're starting to see a lot of is auto tiering. This is probably the newest of the technologies. And this is the ability to, if these shelves are different, let's say the, the first shelf is solid state storage, uh, the second one is maybe high-speed fiber channel mechanical disk. And then maybe we have another one that's SATA, high capacity, low cost. We want to be able to move data between these cost-relevant tiers depending on usage. So something that's very, very active, we want to go to the high-speed but premium price storage. Something that's somewhat active but not dormant, we want on the sort of fiber channel layer. And then finally, something that becomes dormant that we're not using anymore, uh, that one, we want to move to SADA for a high capacity uh, but cost effective situation. So let's talk about some of the challenges with this traditional architecture and why some of these other advances are coming forth. So the big one is that for this to work, you have to get it all from one guy. That's not necessarily bad if you like the guy you're getting it from, but it really it limits your flexibility. And probably a great example that we've seen of this here recently is that solid state storage has come out, different vendors have had different levels of success in implementing that technology and getting full performance or being able to deliver it in a cost effective uh, manner. So flexibility here becomes very important. Of course, the other big one is all, always gonna be cost. 
can I use somebody else's disk and really drive the price down? Well, obviously, in this scenario, you're sort of locked into whatever that pricing that vendor decides to provide. Now, in fairness, they've got to be somewhat competitive because they know this is a competitive marketplace. They just can't absolutely gouge you. But there is a, there is a limit in flexibility. So that's probably the number one thing. The number two thing is that you have to uh, be waiting for them to develop this technology. So you can't go out and if somebody else comes out with an auto tiering technology or something of that nature, you're limited in that. And so what has happened is people started to look at other ways to do this. And one of the big ones was uh, what we call stored virtualization. So let's talk about the, the first step in this sort of flexibility evolution, and that was traditional storage virtualization. The concept behind traditional storage virtualization was that you were able to get more flexibility out of your solution. Because what we did is where we had this controller in the past that controlled everything, and, we, and it came from the storage manufacturer, and then we bought our disks and everything from that storage manufacturer. What changes in this environment is that we go to a software-based model, and then you install the storage software on a traditional server. It could also be an appliance. There are a few vendors that came out with their own appliance. And then what could happen is you could buy the storage systems from anybody you wanted to. So this could be vendor A, this could be vendor B, and this could be vendor C. In the early days of storage virtualization, people looked, or the, the vendors, the storage virtualization vendors, really led with a price uh, attractiveness to the solution. And the problem always with price is, while that sounds good, that generally isn't the sole determining factor in how you're going to implement something in your data center. Often you're looking for something that's easy to use, that is um, flexible, that gives you a lot of features, and really it just allows you to do your job quicker, easier, and more effectively. So that was a challenge. But what we've seen with storage virtualization is some new features that start to really become interesting to people. And one of them we talked about earlier was the concept of auto tiering. And that is the ability now to go get storage from different vendors, not necessarily based on price, but based on capability. And in this case, again, we'll go back to maybe this vendor A is a solid state disk vendor. There are dramatic differences in performance between different vendors and how much they charge for solid state storage, but more importantly, how much performance they get out of their systems. So this gives you some flexibility. And then that vendor B could be, again, a, a mid-range fiber channel solution. And then finally, this uh, dormant tier could be a SADA-based solution, maybe with made capability so that as the data gets uh, dormant and quiesced, we could actually turn the drives off and maybe save a little bit of power. What makes this really interesting is in a, server virt a stored virtualization environment, the ability to automatically move this data to different vendors' tiers based on usage, okay? So that was very attractive and is becoming more attractive in the storage virtualization marketplace. But there were some challenges to traditional storage virtualization. The big one is, if you remember this picture and this one, these, these architectures look very similar. We have one box, we gotta go, except in this case, now we have to go buy the box, uh, we have to load software on it, we still have to select our different arrays, so it really limits um, some of the flexibility because we're recreating that sort of traditional architecture. We're declaring some independence by using software that allows us to use different hardware, but it's not the optimum level. We think the exciting next step in this process is going to be the storage hypervisor. The storage hypervisor builds on the use case that we discussed earlier uh, of the storage virtualization uh, engine, except we use, instead of having to go out and buy a specific server, load software, customize that server, get it all configured, we leverage what you probably already have in place, which is your, your virtualized server infrastructure. So of course that looks like this. We have several hosts, maybe many hosts, all running virtual machines, connects into a storage networking uh, type of switch. 
and then we have different storage systems attached to that switch. We have two options with the storage hypervisor solution. One, and we, one, the, the one we think is uh, probably the most uh, exciting, is to leverage the hypervisor itself to do the work. We're already seeing this from VMware. We expect other uh, companies to be able to do the same thing. And where VMware is adding storage functionality to their product. And so the hypervisor actually ends up doing most of the work. So the hypervisor is already responsible for doing things that we really like about virtualization. For example, moving this VM from this host to this host, right? That same concept is now going to be applied to storage, where this VM's disk image may be on, the, uh, on disk platform A. We're going to now be able, we already can move it to disk platform B, thanks to a feature like storage vMotion. We're already seeing the ability now to make those moves automatically based on the performance requirements of this particular VM. So we expect those capabilities to continue to get crisper and crisper. The advantage of this uh, approach is that each hypervisor now is your own scalable storage controller. You didn't have to go out and buy another server. You didn't have to worry about uh, performance issues or anything like that. Now we have spread out the performance load of the storage function across all of the virtual hosts in the environment and that allows us to scale this storage environment if you will as far as we need to and more importantly it gives us a ton of flexibility down here. Number one, if a, a new vendor comes out with a, a super great solid state storage system or maybe just a really price-focused uh, solid-state storage system, we could very easily plug that in and automatically start moving our performance-sensitive virtual machines to this new SSD without any downtime in the environment. So users would still be accessing the applications. In the background, we would leverage a storage vMotion type of functionality to move data to the new platform. Just like the other environments though, the hypervisor or the storage hypervisor is not perfect and needs a little help. The biggest disadvantage that we see in the hypervisor enabled storage virtualization engine is that the hypervisors just aren't there yet in full functionality from a storage services perspective. And they tend to have performance gaps when we start to enable such important features that we mentioned earlier like thin provisioning, cloning, and snapshots. And those are particularly important in the virtual world because we want to keep disk utilization to a minimum and optimize the resources we do have. So this is where we think there's an opportunity for third-party software applications to come in and enhance the environment. So let's look at these problems. The, the, the problem that the hypervisor has with each of those functions is that it has to allocate disk capacity on the fly. And doing that is just, today anyways, too much load on the hypervisor. Maybe over time they'll fix that, we don't know. But there are companies, this, for example, the sponsor of this video, Versto, that have the ability to enhance that type of performance today. What Versto does is they create a, a log-based architecture that sits in, be, in, in between the hypervisor and the storage so that all inbound writes go to a very small file first and then are quiesced or coalesced and then written to storage the way it wants to be written. What that enables is very, very high performance thin provisioning and snapshot functionality and also releases any of the limits that people are used to with hypervisor-based uh, snapshots and thin provisioning. So this gives us the best of both worlds. We can take advantage of the full functionality of the hypervisor by moving disk images of virtual machines between storage tiers. At the same time, we can get the enterprise features that we've come to expect, like thin provisioning, snapshots, cloning, uh, without any performance loss whatsoever. In, in fact, in most cases, uh, we actually see a performance improvement uh, more so than in any kind of performance impact. 
So that, that becomes a very powerful capability going forward. And as a result, we think this now makes for a very, very good architecture, especially in the virtual environments of virtual desktops and virtual servers, to allow you to have the same flexibility you have in the storage hardware that you already enjoy today in the server hardware. Hope that helps a little bit to explain what the storage hypervisor is all about. Again, I'm George Crump, lead analyst with Storage Switzerland. Thank you very much for tuning in, and again, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Versto, for sponsoring this video. <laughs>